To our knowledge, the Babylonians were the first to predict a solar eclipse at around 750 BCE, but how did they do it? Many concepts we use in science today were derived from early astronomers, but how were scientists back then able to come up with such astronomical calculations? We'll figure that out and take a look at last week's eclipse right here on The Stand. Early civilizations would require calendars to organize the planting and harvesting of crops. The first of these were lunar calendars. Solar calendars were also created, and ancient scientists would often see how these two calendars would overlap. Solar eclipses were rarely, if ever, predicted, while lunar eclipses had a little more of a predictable algorithm. It's thought that Babylonian astronomers were the first to discover the Sero cycle, meaning repetition, which was a cycle that helped predict both lunar and solar eclipses. Like the ancient Chinese, they also recorded solar eclipses when they occurred, but there's no evidence that solar eclipses could have been predicted. So how do we predict eclipses today? Well, the moon's orbit around Earth is slanted about 5 degrees. So when the moon passes through Earth's orbital plane during its full phase, the Earth's umbra, or the darkest portion of its shadow, is casted onto the moon. Since Earth is four times larger than our moon, it's much more difficult to plot a solar eclipse. The moon must pass in between Earth and the sun while at the same time passing through Earth's orbital plane. The moon's umbra is only about 300 kilometers wide when projected onto the Earth's surface, compared to Earth's 12,000 kilometer umbra during a lunar eclipse. So last week I traveled to South Carolina with my university's astronomy club to see the eclipse in totality, and the viewing site we were at literally looked like Mars, but we kept getting pestered with the question as to why we traveled seven hours to see three minutes of totality. In Jacksonville, where we're from, the eclipse maxed out at 90%, but while the difference between 90% and totality may seem small, I realized that there was much more to an eclipse than we initially thought. So what we're seeing now are live projections of the eclipse. How? What happens is, the sun's light, as the eclipse is happening right now, it's about 70%, filters through the tiny little holes in the leaves of this tree onto this white paper, or any surface really, I just put the white paper here to make it look a little more clear, and now you see a bunch of tiny projections of the eclipse. And this acts as a pinhole camera by the camera obscura effect, which is when light filters through a tiny space, diffuses and renders that image, and projects an inverted version of that image. So this is what's happening right now. This is a live image of the eclipse, or hundreds of live images of the eclipse. That's pretty cool. Are you doing it with your hat? Yeah, it totally works, like super easy. Which hole is it? It's all the oh, holes. Oh, it's a bunch of them. It's a bunch of holes. So this hat oh has a bunch of holes. Like a, check that out. It's like a little colander. Nice. Look at that. that Look at all brilliant. these. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so if you still don't understand how amazing the camera obscura effect is, the camera obscura device is over a thousand years old. But in the 19th century, it led Frenchman Niesefort Niepce to actually become the father of photography. He placed a sheet coated with silver salts known to blacken with the sun's light, and he executed the world's first long exposure to produce this, the world's first photograph of life. But what about when the moon completely covers the sun? What happened exactly on August 21st? But what I can tell you is that it began with a lot of waiting. But then something happened. <laughs> this is so stressful. So there are a bunch of clouds in the way and we don't know if we're going to be able to see totality. Now, here's where it gets crazy. During the transition between 95% and totality, you begin to see Bailey's beads, which looks like a chain of beads due to the moon's rough terrain as it just almost covers the sun. Then, once the moon covers the sun entirely, the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona, shines in the midst of those few brief moments of darkness. And once the sun is ready to come out, you'll notice a ring and an initial glare from the sun. This is called the diamond ring effect. So I had my big camera set up with this solar filter taped to the lens, as well as my phone mounted onto a telescope eyepiece. I wanted to capture the eclipse, but I realized that nothing can truly express the magical, mind-numbing moments of totality. If you didn't get 
to experience totality this time around, then 2024 is closer than you think. Remember to hit the like button below and subscribe to DLG Studios and Spinnaker Television for weekly videos, and let us know in the comments where you'd like to see a total solar eclipse from. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time on the stage.